welcome to uh, a first Wednesday, but it's Friday, so I don't hope to confuse you too much. And this is a first Wednesday that was rescheduled from February 3rd, I believe, so we're all mixed up, but that's okay. Ignat will set us straight. Um, since the uh, Humanities Council is sponsoring a special event for next Wednesday, April 2nd, and that is the Ken Burns debut screening of his newest film, The Address, that first Wednesday for, for next Wednesday has been rescheduled to Wednesday, June 4th. And uh, at that time, uh, H. Nicholas Mueller III, who is the retired executive director of the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation, will talk about the famous and controversial Frank Lloyd Wright House, Falling Water. So put that on your calendar, because our first Wednesdays usually end in May. So the uh, next first Wednesday, that will actually be on a Wednesday, is May 7th, and that is a talk by Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist and author Tom Powers will be talking about soft versus hard power in American foreign policy, finding the right mix. Now you've got to listen to this description because it's so uh, appropriate and contemporary, uh, which will examine America's not always successful attempts between the Cold War and today's policy to find the right balance in foreign policy between soft power and military might. So that should be a good, good uh, talk, and that's uh, Wednesdays, May 7. I'd like to uh, uh, thank our local sponsors tonight, and that's the Friends of Brooks Memorial Library, who do all the fundraising, uh, local fundraising for uh, these events. Brattleboro Samuels Alone, the Vermont Country Store, Downs Racklin Martin, and the Wyndham World Affairs Council of Vermont, who are actually uh, sponsoring the uh, May 7th lecture. So I'd like to uh, introduce uh, my friend uh, Peter Gilbert, who's driven all the way from Montpelier. He's the executive director of the uh, Vermont Humanities Council. Uh, which he has been since uh, 2002, and the Humanities Council celebrates its 40th uh, anniversary this year. So congratulations, Peter and the Council. <laughs> Peter is also the author of uh, I Was Thinking Travels in the World of Ideas, which is based on his Vermont Public Radio commentaries, which I'm sure you have heard often. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Jerry, and uh, thanks to the Brooks Memorial Library, which is the fabulous host for the uh, Humanities Council's first Wednesdays program here in, in uh, Brattleboro. Thanks, too, to the Vermont Department of Libraries for its uh, support statewide for the, for the uh, first Wednesdays program statewide in nine sites around Vermont. And finally, uh, thanks to the underwriter for this evening's program, Russian Life Magazine, which has been publishing magazines, maps, and other materials in Montpelier for nearly 25 years. It is an honor and a pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. I told Ignat that I'd been looking forward to this for a long time and about six weeks longer than I thought I was going to be looking forward to. Um, his topic, as you know, t this evening is not music, but you should know something about it. And you should know that Ignat Solzhenitsyn is recognized as one of today's most gifted artists. And he enjoys an active career as both a conductor and a pianist. His lyrical and poignant interpretations have won him critical acclaim throughout the world. He is the principal guest conductor of the Moscow Symphony Orchestra. He has just stepped down after six seasons as music director for the Chamber of Music of Philadelphia to become its conductor laureate. Uh, he is much in demand as a guest conductor, having recently led numerous major symphonies um, uh, not only in the United States, but also in Europe. Uh, in recent seasons, his extensive touring schedules included concerto. Oh, there we go. <coughs> Can you hear me now? Uh, concerto performances in the United States, in Europe, and also throughout the world. A uh, winner of the Henry Fisher Career Grant. I think is on the faculty of the Curtis Institute of Music for the last uh, 10 years, since 2004, on the piano faculty. Born in Moscow, he lives in New York City with his wife and three children. Please join me in welcoming Ignatius Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Peter Gilbert and the Vermont Humanities Council. Congratulations again on your wonderful anniversary. Happy to be part of it tonight and celebrating that throughout the state of Vermont. Uh, thank you to Jerry Carboni and the <laughs> Brooks Memorial Library for hosting this event. Uh, thank you all for coming, even though this is not the regularly scheduled time it was supposed to occur, as uh, Peter referred already. You will forgive me if uh, some of the technological things don't go completely as planned. Uh, let's expect this snafu, and if it doesn't happen, we'll be a step ahead. Uh, Peter referred that this is not uh, my, uh, uh, my métier. I wear another hat in my regular life, but uh, I do have occasion uh, once in a while to speak uh, about my father, various aspects of his work, and to share details that are probably not available to you in the, in the course of your reading uh, or learning about social needs. And the specific topic tonight, writing the red wheel in Vermont. It's tricky to talk about to an American audience or an English speaking audience because uh, unfortunately to date, not the entire book, and it's a massive book, has appeared in English for reasons that are to do with quality of translation and the length of time it takes to, to, to produce and, and so on and so forth. Many of you will be familiar with the first part of the Red Wheel, August 1914, the second installment, November 1916, and then the other two, March and April, the revolution itself, are still forthcoming. The good news is that uh, with my father's centennial, hard to believe, approaching very soon in uh, 2017, 2018, and of course the centennial of the revolution coming in 2017. Plans are afoot to mark those occasions in all kinds of ways, including uh, finally the uh, English publication of the Red Wheel. So if you start by reading August and November, by the time you're done with them, <laughs> the other ones will be out. <laughs> Folks, uh, the creation of the Red Wheel may not have been possible uh, without the working conditions that my father had here in Vermont. As many of you know, in, in the little town, Cavendish, about an hour's drive north of here. So I want to take a moment to recapitulate how, how that happened, how Social Needs and, and our family came, came to be in Vermont, uh, why it happened, and, and then, and then the, the aftermath. So we begin in 1974, which for those of you who know the basics of Social Eastern's biography is after, of course, the war, after his first arrest, eight years in labor camps, cancer, near death, internal exile, meaning in the desert in Kazakhstan, and then eventually being allowed to return to Russia proper <coughs> the publication of One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, which must rank among Nikita Khrushchev's uh, greatest mistakes <laughs> uh, from the point of view of the Communist Party that he headed. Then that increasing battle uh, the, with ever uh, rising stakes uh, against the regime, the Soviet regime, then his second arrest and expulsion in February of 1974. He was arrested, he was charged with treason, he was expelled. Uh, many of you are old enough to remember how big this news was worldwide. For those who don't, I suppose I might remind you just for context that Solzhenitsyn was feted by presidents and prime ministers, kings and queens, <coughs> literally, film stars and, and of course fellow authors. Hundreds of letters poured in every day, dozens of people came every day to our house in Zurich to meet Herr Dr. Solzhenitsyn just for five minutes. Universities conferred honorary doctorates, publishers extended carte blanche contracts, countries offered citizenship. Every important media outlet wanted an interview, or many interviews, and the London Times judged Solzhenitsyn to be, quote, the man who is, for the moment, the most famous person in the Western world. But Solzhenitsyn was not much interested in all the attention. 
uh, intuitively sensing that it presented a grave danger to the great work of his life and the huge artistic goals he had set for himself, goals that he knew he still had to fulfill. In fact, almost immediately upon landing in Germany, and here we see a rather remarkable photograph, I'm sorry it's not the best quality, but this is outside of the home of Heinrich Böll, who was a very esteemed author in his own right. He welcomed my father as a, as a, as a fellow free spirit, and, and uh, my father stayed at his house for the first couple of nights in the West. So this is outside, and you see the pandemonium uh, outside Bill's home. And, and at that time, my father disappointed uh, these reporters because his response, he came out and he made a, a very brief statement. And his statement was, quote, I said quite enough while I was in the Soviet Union. Now I, I shall be silent for a while. And, and, and they didn't really understand how that's possible now that he was out in the free West, why he wasn't prepared to speak and speak and speak. And he sensed that he had to conserve his energy. At that time. He had said everything uh, for, that he needed to say. And he, that attention became almost, almost immediately too much to bear. And he began to think about relocating elsewhere, somewhere not at the crossroads of Europe and by extension of the world. Why Vermont? <laughs> uh, these days we, we, we don't, it's a question that doesn't need answering, but perhaps uh, some people maybe uh, still, uh, still want to know the reasons. It's really a complex of reasons that are outlined here. Archives, of course, not literally. We don't necessarily have first-rate university archives in Vermont, although there are, there are wonderful academic institutions. But uh, what we do have is the proximity of uh, Dartmouth College and uh, the fantastic library that it has there. I just found out tonight the oldest Russian department or sl sl Slavistics or Slavics department in the United States, apparently. And also a key component, which these days is not so important, interlibrary loan. Maybe some of you are in academia or you remember what that used to be. Probably still functions, uh, but at the time was a, a, an incredible resource for any serious researcher to be able to access any publication anywhere virtually in this country simply by requesting and waiting a few weeks while it was sent in. So this is generally a reason why he felt that America was the place to be, because all the great archives were here, particularly relating to his area of study, the Russian Revolution. Privacy, remoteness, security, everybody here who is from Vermont or lives in Vermont is aware, essentially, of those advantages that uh, Vermont, uh, a place like Vermont, shall we say, offers in comparison to the hustle and bustle of, uh, of the big cities. Again, he wanted to be left alone to write, and it ended up that Vermont was the perfect place to do that. Part of it was simply happenstance, to be honest. He didn't set out to uh, move to the Green Mountain State. Uh, some of these parameters that I already mentioned were in play, and uh, a place that suited his needs was available in Vermont. It was also places in some other nearby states that shall remain nameless. Uh, but it could have been elsewhere, but how fortunate that, it, that that this place uh, was in Vermont and, and, and the rest is history. Uh, Winters, I, that's uh, not entirely a serious reason, but he spent enough time in the hot, arid desert of Kazakhstan uh, to make him really appreciate the four seasons and the robust Russian winters. And all things being equal, I know he preferred to, to, to be in a climate such as, such as we have here. So, uh, that's more or less how we ended up in Vermont from coming from Zurich, Switzerland. After we came, my father went to the first town meeting after we moved. As you know, it's uh, I I the beginning of March. And he was given a chance to address the townspeople. And I'd like to just quote part of that brief address. You can also see it on the screen. I like it here, but I hope that my presence will not turn out to be unpleasant for you. I have read in the papers that some of you feel unhappy or even insulted that I have put up a fence around my property. I would like to explain this now. My life consists of work. 
And this work demands that it not be interrupted. An interruption of one's work is enough to ruin it. Boy, is that true. Uh, I have come here from Switzerland, where I first lived after being expelled from the Soviet Union. There I lived in an easily accessible place, and thus hundreds of strangers would come, etc., etc. Furthermore, I have often been visited by reporters, also uninvited, who believe that my life is part of the public domain and that they have the right and obligation to relate every petty detail and so forth. So, people, our neighbors were extremely understanding. Uh, I think most everybody would, would feel and, and, and did feel the same way about their own lives. Uh, everybody uh, wanted to go about their business and uh, throughout those years our neighbors were uh, profoundly respectful and innately tactful uh, with respect to uh, this request from, from my father. So, we're in Vermont, the work now can proceed apace. How did it unfold? For the first time in his life, Solzhenitsyn had the security, the physical, physical security, physical space, the quiet, uh, to be able to work really the way a writer should work or certainly the way he wanted to work. So there we have just a, a picture of a writer in, in his study able to, able to work all day long. He worked in the winters in, in there, and then in the summertime he liked to work outside. This is not a very high quality reproduction, but nonetheless he constructed several tables for himself, including this stand-up desk where I think he was ahead of the curve, where... Uh, <laughs> with the er, er, uh, workplace ergonomics that everybody talks about now. Uh, he liked to work standing up already back then. Now, anyone who has written or published a book, been involved in, in the publication of a book, I'm sure many of you here, in one way or another, are aware what's involved in, a, in its production. Secretaries to type the manuscript, colleagues to offer advice, and peer review agents, to sharpen the marketing pitch, copy editors to harmonize spellings, to find typos, even issues of house style, fact checkers to ferret out any possible inaccuracies, inconsistencies, editors, of course, to work with the author on the finer points of style, even content, graphic designers to prepare the book's layout, choose a font or fonts, provide the overall look and feel, and many other things I'm neglecting to mention. Because of the circumstances of our exile, because being a, a, away from his readership, being away from the natural uh, surroundings, and indeed being uh, very far away even from Manhattan and the great publishing houses there, uh, all of this had to be done totally in-house. And it was done in-house by the three adults in our household, by my father, by my mother, and her mother, uh, my grandmother. And with a little help even from us children. My parents, she indeed acted as his typist, as his proofreader, as his critic, as his editor, as his supporter. Uh, someday, and this is already happening today in Russia, she is alive and well and living in Moscow, but that with him being gone now, little by little more and more avenues are available for scholars to research. I, I think in the future scholars will marvel at the depth intricacy and copiousness of her comments and his work in progress. And there, at times, very passionate debates about characters, about plot lines, about cuts, the necessity of cutting passages or not, and so forth. I remember sometimes, they, they never argued, but they argued passionately about, about passages in his works. I remember going to sleep to, those, to the sounds of very heated debates at times. Here is a quite fascinating picture. You were looking at a fairly typical page of the Red Wheel. It's one of about 14,000 such pages that, were, they, that they produced together during that time. Now it says 6,000 6, pages is the length of Red Wheel. Of course he wrote many other things as well. Uh, so 
this was what their, in addition to the oral arguments, uh, this is what it looked like. So she would, first of all, typeset the works, and then she would write her remarks in one color. And then he would respond in writing, saying, and you can see here, plus means he agrees, and a minus he rejects it, or further discussion, and so forth. And what is especially valuable here is that this entire debate is preserved. It's really a diary of the creative process, and it's preserved for the future, providing an extraordinary insight into the evolution of how a work of art, how a great novel in this case, comes to be. So just a short word about the indispensable involvement of my mother. There was also my grandmother, her mother. You see her here. She, having worked a long career as an aerospace engineer back in Moscow, she, Ekaterina Svetlova, some of you in this room remember her and, and, and met her. She played a crucial role in any tasks involving precision, involving patience, involving hand-eye coordination. For example, in this photo, in chiseling umlauts and accent aigu and every other kind of strange symbol that wasn't available on the machines back then, and we'll talk about those in a moment. So she had to produce them in a way that would be imperceptible, ideally, to, to the reader holding the book in his hand. It shouldn't look like a, uh, uh, like, a, like a handmade or homemade adventure. So she had an important role in her own right. Children, as I mentioned, also were involved in the work as well. Our parents thought that by bringing us in some degree into their work team, that they would not only uh, profit by the exploitation of child labor, <laughs> but also give us an opportunity to, to work closely with language, which of course was the most important thing maybe in our, in our family language and the meaning of words, uh, really to understand what their work was all about. I, I'm, as an aside, I'm often asked, when did you first realize that your father was who he was, that your father was a great writer, that your father was such an important figure? And I don't remember exactly when, but I feel like I've always known it. And I think the reason I don't remember not knowing it is because little by little, as we were growing up, we became part of, again, and this, I want to emphasize in a small way, but became part of, that, of, of the work. So it was just an organic process. We knew early on what it was that he did and why, more or less, why, why he was doing it. Here's a brief clip. Now, I'm, I'm not sure if you'll be able to hear the sound very well, but this is a rather lovely clip, a short video clip from a French documentary film. One of the few times that journalists, or in this case, a very prominent French television presenter, a book presenter, they do have shows about books in, uh, in France, and I guess these days on C-SPAN also in this country. Uh, this clip shows, let's see if it works first. This shows my older brother, Yermolai. Yermolai tape les textes de son père sur une imprimante qui donne des pages analogues à celles d'un livre et sur lesquelles ce génétique so also at work portera plus tard ses corrections. And, and, and helping with various tasks of which there were always too many. And, and then that morphs right away into my younger brother, Stefan, and he actually speaks very, very beautifully here for a very little boy. Stefan, the plus jeune, lui aussi aide son père. Qu'est-ce que tu fais, Stefan? Я печатаю первую машинопись словаря написанного. So he's explaining, obviously, what it is that he's typing in. It's a dictionary that my father was putting together. Rare Russian words. Разные слова использованы век и больше назад, которые сейчас в русском языке не используются. Цель этого словаря – это расширить русский язык с того места, как он сейчас есть. So, now, uh, you, you saw what my brother, what my other brother was using to type there, and I'd like to just move to this next photo. And, and I'd like to talk just for a moment, because again, you won't hear this elsewhere, uh, about the technology uh, involved in pulling, pulling this off. 
in, in the days before. Now, I know that some people here use computers all day, every day, and some, of you, some people here may not realize that things have moved on from this, so there's a whole <laughs> spectrum. But, um, you know, th this, this was state-of-the-art at the time, the IBM Electronic Selectric Composer. Uh, th for those of you who are technology geeks, it's about 16 kilobytes of memory, so about six lines of text that it actually remembered, uh, that it, you could save at any given time. Uh, this was really the champion of, of uh, the, the exhibit A of the advanced technology that, that, and it really was the best technology available at the time, at least to home users, to regular users. And uh, I would say that this was a, quite an impressive machine, but also very temperamental. And it constantly was breaking down. Literally, nobody visited our house more often than the IBM repairman. <laughs> uh, he was there, it seemed, every week he would come. He would come in the morning, he would work in the morning, he would have lunch. Have a, you know, my mom would <laughs> make all the Russian cakes and everything. So he would have a long lunch and then work again and come back the next day. And it seemed it would take a long time to fix it. Then it would work for a few weeks and then, uh, and then you know, it would happen again. So just a couple of pictures really for fun, of, of what was involved in, 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 in producing this, that it needed ribbon, really like a typewriter. So it was more or less an electric typewriter, so that, that's the ribbon that was used. Uh, that, this was really a, a kind of an amazing thing. Uh, maybe some of you remember these. It's a beautifully engineered font heads that, very frail, and these letters would peel off very easily. But any font you could think of or that had ever been designed, you could get, but the trouble is, of course, it was only one at a time. And so we'll talk about that later, but the difficulty and the incredible hassle of changing from one font to the next is something that to anybody younger than, than, than uh, 30 years old is, is, is it, uh, incomprehensible. Uh, then there was, of course, so this is what I'm talking about. Th this is a, a rather involved page, but by no means a unique page from the red wheel showing that the intricate variety of fonts that my father needed to have, because this is a chapter of newspaper, a compilation of newspaper fragments reflecting the revolution from, from papers all around the world. And so you see that every time the font changes to, a, to an italic or to a bold or to, to, to anything else, my mother had to take out that, that and put it aside and, and dig out the right one from her collection of fonts and put it in and, put, and hope it doesn't get stuck and so forth. And so this was a, a, a really an incredibly laborious process for what today would, would just take a few minutes. Then had to be, this material had to be saved. And so these are the magnetic cards. That's the packet and then that's the actual card. It's about, yeah, 10 by 4 inches. It's about like this uh, in, in the hand and it would go inside and, and that also I think could store about 200 KB, so about two pages per, per one card. And so we have hundreds or thousands of these cards that held eventually the entire red wheel and other works of Solzhenitsyn. The final product, the result of all this labor, ended up being these very beautiful thick sheets of matte chalk paper. I wanted to bring some with me, but I, I couldn't find it uh, just now. Uh, they were coated in the reverse side with this light green coating, and the text was perfectly laid out on the front side. These sheets were literally shipped, the actual paper was shipped to a typography, to a, a letter press in France, where they were simply photocopied and the books came out. And what you see here is, is one such book. This is the eighth volume of the collected works. So the IMCA Press, or YMCA Press, was the publisher, uh, 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 the, the premier Russian emigre publisher uh, in, in the West, in the center of Russian culture in the West, Paris. But the imprint actually said Vermont, Paris, because it was a joint effort, and frankly, all the effort was on this side, uh, because <laughs> they just put it out, and, and everything was done. So, and you, and, uh, you saw what it, more or less what it looks like. I, I also wanted to show a photo of inside, but you already saw some of the, how, how, how the layout was. Mm, I think this speaks for itself. Oh my. Uh, my father said it was by far the most productive years of his life. 
uh, the 18 years spent in Ver Vermont, and you can see uh, the result right there, uh, as it happened exactly 20 volumes. All of this would have been daunting enough for your regular uh, garden variety novel. But consider now the huge task that Solzhenitsyn was facing. Uh, really a kind of impossible goal he'd set for himself. The Red Wheel, what was it? And what is it? And how did it come to be? When he was nine years old, and he was a precocious child, he read two books that left a, a lifelong imprint. The first one you all know, the second one probably not. War and Peace. He read War and Peace and, and like so many people was, even at nine years old, struck by the, by the grandeur, by the scope, by the breadth of that canvas. The other book was memoirs of one of the key figures in the Russian Revolution, Shulgin. Memoirs of it. He was a deputy of the Duma and, and he had wrote brilliant, very powerful, emotional memoirs of, of that time and of his work and of, of course of his ultimate complete failure because uh, he was one of the, uh, shall we say, more or less good guys, was swept away by the Bolsheviks when they, when they came in. And so when he read those two books, he knew he wanted to be a writer, and moreover, he knew he was going to write this book. As you will see, the conception of the book changed, and, and uh, he learned, uh, as they say now, lifelong learning. He learned, he kept learning about his subject during the 50 years that he devoted to actually writing it, from 18 years old until 68. That was nine years old. At 15 years old, there was a spectacular murder uh, amongst all the lawless uh, genocide that was happening in the Soviet Union. There was a, uh, an important murder because it was of an important party boss. It was uh, a man called Kirov, and he was the number one party figure, meaning the most important person, the most powerful person, in Leningrad. My father was 15 when that happened, and he read in the papers that this unfortunate thing had happened. And I don't remember now what the official line was. Whatever the official line was, he knew it was a lie. And he marveled at that age because he knew that Stalin had removed him. And of course, you know, he deserved it, but uh, obviously uh, revolution eats its own children. But he couldn't understand why don't these adults around me, why don't they see it? Or how can they, I'm 15 and I see it, how, co how, can they, how come they don't see it? And so that was another powerful uh, motivator to, to write the truth about history and to write it in a way that people will, would have to engage with or would have to face. At the time, of course, his idea was to glorify Lenin. So this, he, he was, a, was laboring under the uh, notion, mistaken notion, as he would later find, found out, find out that uh, Stalin had somehow ruined what was, all, what was a perfectly uh, wonderful enterprise started by, by Lenin. And the, very ironic that the, therefore, the primary, the, one of the prime movers be, behind this book, The Red Wheel, was to praise the revolution, and to praise Lenin, and to praise uh, the new uh, dawn, dawn the, the new paradise that was dawning in Russia. There was also a stroke of fate. When, as a young man, of course, World War II came and, and he volunteered, enlisted. I didn't want to take him at first because he had poor eyesight, but eventually they enrolled him in, in artillery school, and lo and behold, he was an officer, and he was marching into, into Germany, into East Prussia. It's just, map gives you an idea, those of you who are geography buffs, where, where that is, the easternmost reach of, of Germany, traditionally. And... This was quite extraordinary. He took it almost as a, as, a, as a providential sign because, of course, it was precisely in East Prussia that the great catastrophe, the so-called Samsonov catastrophe of World War I had occurred. That was the place where just weeks into World War I, or the Great War as it was then known, the Russian army suffered a, a, an unimaginable, <laughs> catastrophically stupid and decisive defeat in East Prussia, and really the outcome of the war 
many historians feel was already predetermined there, at least that Russia could not win. And so here he was 23 years later, walking through the same, marching through the same villages, the same towns uh, that, uh, where, where this had happened. Moreover, his father had volunteered in that war and had fought in those same uh, villages and those same towns. And so he obviously felt also a, a great connection with him. And uh, it was another reason that he said, I need to describe this, uh, what happened in August 1914 on the fields of East Prussia. Now, here's a short clip of Solzhenitsyn himself describing this. I'm if, I think it's just in Russian, so you'll bear with it. It's very short, if you would just bear with me. I think it still gives you an idea. He's describing, he's asked about the human and inhuman aspects of war and about this idea of World War I and World War II and his father and himself and, and what is the meaning of that front in both Alexander wars. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, that you have fought against the Nazis de 1941 à 1945, vous êtes entré dans l'armée comme soldat, vous avez terminé comme capitaine, vous avez été deux fois décoré, et je me dis en lisant, je me disais en lisant ce, ce, cette histoire de la guerre de, de, de 14, je me disais qu'au fond, vous devez être très fasciné par l'aventure à la fois humaine et inhumaine qu'est la guerre. So it seems that you were fascinated by the human and inhuman aspects of war. Non, mais il y a un chat qui se fait pas là, c'est celui qui dit, il y a un dommel, et tout. Я задумал это повествование еще до войны. Я избрал Восточную Пруссию, избрал Самсоновскую катастрофу. И вдруг, волею судьбы, я в эту войну пошел точно по этим местам. То есть прошел прямо по Самсон... как, как шла Самсоновская армия, так я пошел в 45-м году. И поэтому я все эти места... Какая-то какая сила меня связала с, этой, с этим событием. Так что я снова его увидел через... 20, uh, 30, yes, no, okay, so now in this clip, which is translated into English with a little bit inferior sound quality, again, this is not a, a brief clip where you will hear him describe how the work came to be. I apologize if I've already pre-adumbrated some of that in my own remarks. And so his life's work dreamt of and begun during his youth in an attempt to understand and explain the history of the 1917 revolution took shape. My generation is the last generation to be able to write about this material as an event which is more or less part of our living memory rather than a part of history. My childhood memories are steeped in the post-revolutionary atmosphere. In the 1920s, everybody came from before the revolution. I can still feel this everybody atmosphere. Everybody came from before the revolution. It helps me to find the appropriate material. I had the idea of creating these knots, designed to result in a dense exposition of events. This method involves finding the critical points in the curve of our history, in mathematics, such points are called nodal points. I consider these nodal points, these knots, in their most dense form. I take 10 or 20 days of continuous narrative. I always choose those points that determine an event, not necessarily an external event, but an internal one, where history is at a turning point. I write about these 20 days in detail, explaining them from all sides. I break off between two knots, which is how the idea of knots was formed. You know, the funny thing about these uh, clips that exist, and, and entire films and, and so forth, is whenever there is voiceover, such as this, I'm always struck by the contrast between what I perceive to be very vivacious and, and active uh, uh, father, uh, very engaged and, and with beautiful mimicry and, and gestures, and this very ponderous, <laughs> slow voice, the way that 
a Russian writer is supposed to sound, maybe, but <laughs> let's notice that in this clip. But if you were, I don't know how closely you were paying attention or were able to hear what he was saying, he's talking about these knots, these nodes. And this is really quite a striking thing that I'd like to now just um, to talk for a couple of moments as we come to the, to the end of my remarks. How was this red wheel organized? Follow the evolution of his design. So we already said that he was planning to describe the October Revolution, the glorious October, the triumph of Lenin, the new dawn. He came quickly to see, well, not so quickly, eventually he came to realize that it wasn't much of a revolution, it was really just a coup d'etat. It was an event that just happened overnight, uh, and although it had far-reaching consequences, its own inevitability had been predetermined. So it wasn't October, it was February, the February 1917 revolution, that was the key to, to Russian history and indeed perhaps world history in the 20th century. Then they need to go further back and to explain the roots of February. February didn't just happen. Why did it happen? How did it happen? So he goes back to August 1914 and the Samsonov catastrophe. But why did Russia enter the Great War? With the anniversary of that war upon us now, many of us have been reading books about that war, reevaluating the madness, uh, the really utter uh, senselessness. Uh, you could say every war is senseless, but, but, but th there was nobody had a stake in that particular war, really. Uh, why did it happen? And so my father felt that without, if Stolypin had still been prime minister, that's outside the bounds of our discussion today, but a, a, a great statesman, maybe the only great statesman Russia had prior to the revolution, he would not have allowed Russia to enter this foolish war, certainly a war that had really no, nothing in it for, for Russia to gain. And so he goes back further. Well, as this happened, he be, be, began to understand that there were key points, moments when, as he explained in this video, either the actual crucial events were occurring right, in, uh, right at that moment, or the seeds were being laid for an important event down the line. And so, I think we go to our next slide. What is a node or a knot? That can be translated in different ways. I think node says it better. You have here the various definitions of node, but this is the one that as a mathematician he had in mind. A point at which two branches of a curve intersect, each branch having distinct tangent. And so this idea that these historical plot lines that are not visible to the uh, naked eye, that are by definition intangible, do come into tangent contact and then result in, in explosive uh, consequences. But even then the evolution of his thinking was still incomplete because he thought it was necessary to devote one volume to each of the 20 nodes that he had identified as crucial turning points in the Great War, the February Revolution, now we're going forward, the October Revolution or the coup d'etat, the Civil War and eventually the utter triumph of the Bolsheviks. Here is that original scheme. So the Red Wheel is the name of this giant book, a narrative in discrete periods of time. Discrete, as you fans of, of uh, uh, English language will know, the discrete and that spelling means specific, right? Discrete periods of time, specific concrete periods of time. And so he had identified these 20 nodes from 1 to 20 as the key points that we were discussing here. And the idea was he would write essentially one volume each, and 20 volumes, it wouldn't be all that long, and it would be, <laughs> uh, there you would have the red wheel. But as he worked, of course, the volume of the, of the material became overwhelming. And these first nodes had to be expanded. More importantly, he realized that the logic of the material already dictated, there was no need to go on and finish this because by April, that's Node 4, April 1917, and that is the last installment of the Red Wheel, as you will see here. So I've now grayed out the ones that never came to be written. And you see that those first four got expanded. If you do your math, 2 plus 2 plus 4 plus 2, it's already 10 volumes there. Four nodes, 10 volumes, that was enough. 
Uh, I don't think he could have done it in less, in less space, in less detail. But he also realized after April, once the provisional government, once the Tsar abdicates, abdicates in a very, one might say today, a flippant way. It wasn't intended to be flippant, but uh, did, did he know what he was doing, what, to what he was consigning Russia's future? And then the utter lack of will and lack of foresight uh, on the part of the provisional government. Chaos in society, and the only group, tiny and in, unimportant as they were, who knew exactly what they were doing were Lenin, Trotsky, and the Bolsheviks. And so Lenin comes in, as you students of history will know, through the sealed train wagon, as we now know, authorized by the Kaiser. It was a huge risk and a huge secret, of course, at the time, but he's allowed to pass through the war theater and arrive famously at the Finland station and in St. In, in, in St. Petersburg, Petrograd, as it was known then. And the rest, the rest was inevitable. I'd like to play one last video clip in which my father then explains the mechanics. You understand now, I hope, that the, the, the conception and the, and the design of this book. Now, a little bit about the mechanics, going back to, if you will, almost the technological aspect. How do you put this together? Let's see, uh, this is very brief. I don't, I don't think there's English here, but then I'll just translate or explain. Uh, so, take a look at that machine as well. I'll translate this in a moment. Some of you read French. So, how do you, all that material that was coming in through the interlibrary loan and through books that were being sent, journals and newspapers, he would divide it, he would categorize it, break, in, break it down into these tiny bits, dozens of categories, and you see these categories laid out here on this table. And this was like that for years. This wasn't, you know, this was, this was his system. For years and years, material would, would, would be added to these categories. He would work through it. He would then craft his chapters, and he pointed to the table over here. He would then create, he would write, and he would, he would put things together in, in, in the actual book, and that would go over there. What he used uh, to do this, I think is our next slide. Yeah, you can see these, again, they're, 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 this is just a small sample of those dozens and dozens of categories. They would go by date. They would go by geography, geographical regions. Moscow and St. Petersburg and the different aspect, the different timelines of the revolution that were happening there. Of course, the major c characters, the Tsar, Lenin, Trotsky, uh, Kerensky, and the rest. His fictional characters that are intertwined discreetly into the red wheel as well. That's one at, at the top of that pile. And then even unexpected categories, deity, children, ptitsis, birds, animals, these were things he wasn't planning to, you know, write in, in, in nature encyclopedia. This was simply, simply, simply threads of news stories or of recollections that, that were important enough that he thought they could give a certain flavor and that he found places to put them uh, in, in, in the Red Wheel. So, and then something else that I'd like you to see is this sea of microphones. Again, uh, it's, a, I suppose, a very outdated technology, but if you notice that machine in the corner, yet an, another kind of antediluvian machine in that last clip, that was the microfilm reader that he used to pour over hours and hours, day after day after day, week and after week, for years and years. Here's a close-up, maybe you could read a little bit more here. Most of these came from the Hoover Institution at Stanford, who were very generous in... in it's, it was and remains today the premier source for papers on the Russian Revolution. And so 
These are various papers, books, everything you could imagine. And so he would take the, you know, each one was a box, and you, some of you have worked with microphones, and take the reel out and more or less put it in that contraption, and then there was a light, and more or less just a way to read. You could do the same thing, it would be more tiring against the, against the background light. And he would take all his quotes that he, for newspapers and eyewitness accounts and the rest of it from here. So, so there you have it. That's the, how the Red Wheel was designed, and that's more or less how it was implemented in, again, specifically here in Vermont uh, during those 18 years of exile. So critical was that what were, were the logistics, if you will, of his life here to the completion of this task that though he longed to go back to Russia as soon as possible and of course did and spent the remaining 14 years of his life there he delayed his departure somewhat his return to Russia so that he could finish the red wheel here because he knew he wouldn't have uh, that peace and that that opportunity and that space uh, and everything else that we've talked about here today to complete this monumental task. I wanted to finish today by reading a little bit uh, from from the Red Wheel, but we may be up against time. I know that people, uh, I think, will want to ask questions, and so uh, I think I will, with your permission, let you do your own reading uh, of the Red Wheel. Again, August 1914. November 1916, as you know, the first two installments have been out of print, are coming back into print this year. Uh, and uh, yeah, they're coming back into print this, this summer. So, uh, and will be available ebooks and iPads and Kindles and all that stuff as well. And then, as I said, by the time you finish with those, uh, the translations uh, we hope will be ready by 2017. So, with that, again, I'll, I'll forego my reading and leave. Uh, leaves a little bit of time for any questions you may have. Thank you. I'm told there are microphones. We have uh, microphones not... uh, that people will just wait until we have someone give you a microphone. If you feel very confident in your vocal capacity, then you, I think you can feel free, but otherwise it's probably would be helpful if you would wait for the microphone so to make sure everybody can hear you, please. Could you read just a little bit till someone gets yes, a microphone? Yes, please read. Just a tiny bit. <laughs> yes, to do that, this is, I think it went pretty smoothly, but I have a snafu because I left my reading material in this bag. So, old school. Okay. Well, this is quite uh, marvelous stuff. <clears throat> this is the end of the third volume of March, 1917. So at this point, revolution is in full throttle. The Tsar has abdicated uh, on March 2nd. This is now March 9th, which in the incredible compression of those days, I think to everyone seemed like an eternity when events like that happened in history. <clears throat> I neglected to mention something else that's crucial about the Red Wheel and, and it's, it's the idea of how, how, how to write it, is that every chapter is written, most chapters, some of them are officially neutral, but most of them are written from the point of view of a given character. He tra he, so he writes chapters from the point of view of Lenin. And as much as he uh, reviled Lenin, and the more he studied him, the more he reviled him, the writing is quite extraordinary and because one really ends up rooting for him to succeed. Uh, it's written with this incredible sympathy and, and really getting into, I think, and critics have said extremely successfully, into the mind of, of really this psychopath, uh, but also you know, a, a genius in a way. So he, that's the idea, is that, is that we will understand these characters better if the writer tries to become them. And so this is a chapter that is written from the Tsar's uh, point of view. And uh, the Tsar, Nicholas II, is a character that he is very critical of, but at the same time finds, uh, I think, a lot of compassion. So the Tsar is, uh, uh, now that, 
abdicate, emasculated really, his power is gone, and he's now allowed finally to join his family after the deed is done. So he's back at Tsarske Silo at his summer retreat, and he's really in a, kind of in a state of stupor. The chapter is called Produced for Inspection. On the Tsar's return to Tsarske Silo, his retreat, his first hours were spent with his children. First with the heir, Alexei, the heir to the throne, whose room was brightly lit since he had already recovered. Next, he saw his daughters. This narrative, of course, picks up from the previous Tsar chapter so many pages before. The elder princesses were on the mend. Everybody had been sick. Little Anastasia, his youngest, was still unwell, while Maria, who was seriously ill, lay in a fever in a completely darkened room. She could not fully take in the fact of her father's arrival and drifted between wanting to make sure he really had come and rambling on about some mob of terrible men who were coming to kill Mama. After spending only a while in their rooms, Nicholas could feel what a burden his dear wife had borne in tending all these sick children at the same time, especially in times like these. But Olya and Tanya were simply elated at Father's homecoming. Though they were still lying down, they assured him that they were really quite better now. To them, his arrival put an end to all their woes. That was all they could talk about as they squirmed around in their pillows. Now we're all together again, Papa and Mama were not afraid of a thing. Alexei had cheered up too, and Nicholas took him in his arms and hugged him, not speaking and trying not to betray how lost he felt. Talking had become such an effort for him. While Benkendorf was present, this is a kind of chief of staff or his trusted courtier. While Benkendorf was present, he tried to speak of trivial matters but habit and, this, and all the self-possession he could muster were unequal to the task. There was such an aching, hollow feeling within him that all he could do was shut himself away, close his eyes, and lie in silence, stiff and numb. Powerless now to evince any sign of life, Nicholas could not bear to be alone with anyone other than Alex. And that was his nickname for his wife, Alexandra. Alex, Alex, the heir to the throne is Alexei. And they went down to their private rooms, locked the doors behind them. Walking in the park was forbidden, house arrest. But Nicholas could replenish his strength by spending a few hours with Alex, slumped in silence. He had to go through this interval of wordless immobility in order to emerge revivified. Alexandra made him lie down on the couch. She sat beside him applying cold, damp cloths to his brow. By the way, virtually every detail is factual from, from diaries or from eyewitness accounts or from something. And then, of course, the psychology, by definition, is, is, is a guess. The Empress's chambermaid did not so much knock as gently stroke the door. Your Majesty... Count Benkendorf begs to speak with you. Alex rose quietly and left the room. Agitated and embarrassed, his narrow side whiskers a tremble, Count Benkendorf told a garbled tale of how some commissar or other from the Council of Workers' Deputies, this is just all coming in the last few days, some Council of Workers' Deputies has been set up, he has arrived and His Majesty must appear before him. Appear? The Empress snapped angrily. She could still feel her own reserves of strength, and her sense of responsibility grew, even as those of her royal consort waned. The Tsar has not scheduled any audiences. The Count wrung his hands. How could an old courtier like himself not understand it? But the military commander of the palace said there was no other way out. Would it please Her Majesty to hear his explanation in person? As always, the man's duties, the man's decisions fell to her lot. In his present condition, Nicky, Nicholas, was incapable of deciding for himself. So the Empress walked through into the green, obviously the point of view shifts to her. The Empress walked through into the green drawing room just as she was. The dress she wore for tending the children had become her habitual attire. And there she received Staff Captain Katsubu. 
And Cebu explained that he had no choice. He was powerless to argue with the Petrograd Council, this Council of Workers' Deputies. And the council wished to assure itself that His Majesty was indeed still there. It was enough to make you choke. But where do they think he's got to? Where else could he possibly be? However, Kotsubu held his ground. If it came to a clash with the council's forces, that would spell trouble for all concerned. But with a great deal of difficulty, they found a way of arranging things peaceably. And really, it would be quite a trivial formality, not too burdensome for His Majesty. He did not have to receive this commissar, nor talk to him, nor even greet him. The plan was that upstairs, at that place by the picture gallery where the corridors intersect, the Tsar would walk along one corridor without stopping. And this commissar would watch from the other corridor. And that was all there was to it. The commissar would be surrounded by armed officers from the escort regiment. He wouldn't be able to move or give any offense. There was nothing for it but to agree. Being virtual prisoners, they hardly had much choice in the matter. Yet, the Empress knew the state she had left the Emperor in. Would he be able to appear at all, mute and enfeebled as he was? But surely this business can be put off for, for a couple of hours, even just for one hour. Alas, would that it could, the staff captain was deeply worried. In an hour, any chance of a peaceful outcome <coughs> might be lost. Her Majesty cannot begin to imagine what dangers have already been averted. Obviously, she had to give in. Alexander went to prepare Nikki. He was lying on his back, sunk in a drowsy torpor, his mouth half open, groaning. Her heart bled to see him like this. What had he done to deserve this new suffering and humiliation? She cradled his head in both hands and caressed him as she woke him. He had trouble comprehending what was going on, but why? Where do I have to go? What for? But he believed her. Onerously, laboriously, he raised himself a little then sat up. He changed out of his dressing gown in the bedroom, putting on his household cavalry uniform. He always changed swiftly and easily, a habit acquired in the army. His eyes and his many deep wrinkles showed up like pits in his somber face. Alex made the sign of the cross over him, and he went out to join Benkendorf and Volgarukov though it was hard to say whether he had understood or was still in a daze. Thank heaven he did not have to speak to anyone. It was just like taking a little stroll along the corridor, since, after all, the park was out of bounds now. But how shameful even a stroll could be for a deposed monarch. They went up to the second floor. Benkendorf respectfully explained to the Tsar when and where and how he was to walk as far as the room of his valet, Vokov. Oh, and it had to be done without headgear. Had he understood or had he not? He took off his hussar's cap and placed it on the windowsill in the corridor. Benkendorf himself hurried on ahead with Dolgorukov to take up their positions while the Tsar was supposed to linger here for two or three minutes. Then he set off, as if oblivious or sleepwalking, as if he were not involved, not even present at all. He opened the broad panel doors himself. Beyond them, down where the corridors crossed, beneath glass roofs that now scarcely let through the light of the dying day, every single lamp was brightly lit. The pain made Nicholas screw up his eyes a little. He walked along slowly, aimlessly. Three paces from the intersection stood the commissar, dressed in the uniform of an official in the military commission, but wearing a large, shaggy, Caucasian fur hat on his head. 
one of his short legs was thrust forward. Behind him, two tense officers stood guard. And it was, it was impossible to miss their unnatural position, right hands resting inside their pockets. There, too, stood the staff captain of the Ulans. It's a regiment. Neither he, neither he nor the other officers saluted, but they came to attention. Ben Kendorf followed suit. But the commissar did not stir and did not remove his hat. He stood there with that same wild appearance, one foot forward, as if he had taken a step toward the Tsar. And nobody told him, too late perhaps, to get his hat off. And no one could bring himself to reach out and whip it off for him. In the silence that fell, you could hear people breathing. There was something tentative about the Tsar's steps, not at all his usual way of walking, with a faint, resonant tinkling of his spurs. As he walked, his very gait conveyed his bewilderment. What was he supposed to do now? And having no hat on was odd. It made it hard to hold one's head up firmly like a military man. His haggard appearance, the inflamed eyelids and drooping bags under the eyes, his limp mustache, how he had aged. All he had to do was cross the junction of the corridors as quickly as possible without looking around, not so much as a sidelong glance, and walk away, make his escape. That was all. But the Tsar could, could not pass by without noticing the tense group of men standing off to one side. He naturally turned his head towards them. Then slowed his step, then changed direction, took a half step this way, then another, searching their faces in confusion, baffled at first as to why they were standing there, and why in this odd configuration, and, and who is that in a snake-like fur hat? But more serpentine still were the eyes. The hatred in them stung and burned. The commissar's face was contorted. He quivered as if in a fever. Confronted with this stark manifestation of pure malice, the Tsar stopped, came to himself, and sensed what was before him. His ravaged, swollen face revealed lucid understanding, and with it, utter enervation. He swayed slightly from one foot to the other, one shoulder twitched, and he was already turning to go, but could not refrain out of politeness from nodding farewell to the group. He nodded and set off unsteadily, not walking off in the same direction straight ahead, but back the way he had come. listening so attentively. Um, and, and I think if you, what you'll find is if you read the Red Wheel is that the, 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 the variety of tone and, and, and of mood is limitless. Uh, so from, from deeply lyrical passages to, to uh, very quick, cho choppy, very modern uh, perspectives. You saw the newspaper fragments. There are screenplay fragments where an image is so powerful he felt it could only be, like in Dos Passos, could only be shown as a movie, as a film. And so he has certain three or four pages in a row that are written as a screenplay with cuts and with pans and with, 
and, 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 and those are some of the most striking passages of the book. So the variety of tone is, is, is tremendous. Thank you so much. That was really captivating and engaging. Appreciate your making that trip. Um, could you talk a little bit about just quotidian daily life? Like, did you bring friends home? Did they go to school events? Did you go shopping? That kind of stuff. Well, we didn't feel, certainly speaking for myself, and I think my brothers would agree, that um, we had a, an irregular uh, childhood. I think it was, in retrospect, it was different. I think the main difference was maybe what I already referred to, was our very clear sense instilled by the example and indeed the daily life of our parents that their existence was very clearly defined for a very clear purpose, maybe more than most of us are able to recognize in our, in our lives. And so I think in that sense it was different because there was never any question what everything, what, what the perspective was, what everything was about. But we had to eat, we had to go to the grocery. Uh, my grandmother would do a lot of the cooking, but we would help, we would do chores, all the usual things. In Cavendish, where we li live, up, in, up on the hill, even for Cavendish it's quite remote, people don't really come and visit each other that much because it's just too remote. It's not, I mean, here in Brattleboro, maybe in Main Street, you can walk over to the other house, but um, there it's really, you have to, somebody has to drive you. So until that key, 16 years old, comes around, you know, you're at the mercy of what your parents or, or, or your friend's parents are willing to do. So, but my parents were very uh, perfectly happy to have, to have, have our friends come over. I mean, the only rule really was, was noise level. And... <clears throat> And even that was uh, somehow, I think, 3.30 was more or less when we came, came home from school. And that was the time uh, that before which, if it was a snow day or if it was summer or whatever, that before which time we weren't supposed to make a lot of noise. For example, play, play basketball. And, 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 and you know, the basketball was a very loud sport, right? And so, so every time, especially when you miss a shot. And so, <laughs> and so we, we were asked not to do that. But otherwise, I think it was uh, reasonably normal. Other questions? We'll try to rotate sides a little bit. Yes? Uh, sir, would you be willing to take a question having little to do with the Red Wheel or with Vermont? It depends. <laughs> I'll try this. The current situation in Russia and the Ukraine, if the Ukrainian Orthodox Church... I'm sorry, is this better? Yes, if, if the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, Moscow Patriarchate, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, Kiev Patriarchate, and the Greek Catholics, I'm sorry for this question, but considering who you are, I thought that perhaps you might have some thoughts on this. If the schism had been worked out, if the schism didn't exist in the church, would we be seeing events unfold differently than we are? Uh, maybe with thoughts about, is there actually any ethnic difference between Ukrainian mm. and Russian? Uh, is this part and parcel of a broader historical process? Well, I was expecting uh, probably the first question to be about Crimea <laughs> or about Ukraine. <laughs> so it's good we delay that to a second question. Uh, but uh, to be honest, I wasn't expecting and please don't take any offense, but I wasn't expecting such a thoughtful question as, 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 as you've asked, precisely because it's natural that as we follow current events, uh, whatever they may be, I, I'm gripped by this tragedy of uh, uh, Malaysian Flight 370 and, and this de ever deepening, every day the mystery deepens, what, what happened and the various theories. And uh, the point is we, we, if we, if we have any uh, right to call ourselves human beings and to, uh, and to have sympathy for each other and empathy, then of course we care about, uh, not just about what happens next door, but what happens around the world. So uh, obviously uh, the very tense situation uh, in Ukraine, in Crimea, in Russia has been on everybody's mind. But 
I was expecting really just a kind of a political question, uh, which I'm really, frankly, less interested in, in, uh, in answering, uh, precisely because the situation is very complex and its roots go deep and go a long way back in, in Russian history, in Ukrainian history, in the hist Polish-Lithuanian history, in the mix, uh, because Ukraine changed hands so much. And I appreciate your, your attempt to place it in that context. I would hesitate to give a clear answer on the somewhat esoteric um, question, very important question, of the uh, administrative divisions amongst the churches. Just parenthetically, it's, Ukraine is a place where East meets West. One of the ways that illustrates that very, in a very picturesque way, one might say, is the notion of the Union Church, where very briefly, orthodoxy is over here in the East, Catholicism is over here in the West, then eventually Protestantism and, and the Reformation is another story, but the East and West, and right on that battleground in the, in the Ukraine, a compromise was devised whereby the rites and the pageantry, the beautiful music, the in, incense, the iconography of the East would remain, but loyalty would be pledged to the Pope in Rome. And so Uniate, a kind of best of both uh, kind of uh, 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 a model was tried out and, and has, I suppose, been successful in the sense that that church still 400 years later still exists, but of course is far from, uh, far from makes far from everybody happy. And there are plenty of uh, Orthodox Ukrainians, the majority of Ukrainians are Orthodox, uh, there are some Catholic Ukrainians in the far west. Um, and then, of course, as you say, the, the very wrenching and pregnant uh, question of to what extent are Ukrainians a, an entirely separate uh, nationhood, an entirely separate people, to what extent are they not at all? And I think as in so many cases of identity, you have to ask them. And, and you have to ask them, and, and their answers differ as much as, as much as those religious divisions exist. And even you refer to the schism even between the Orthodox churches of the Ukraine, which is really madness. It's purely politics, really. I, I don't think there's any other way to, to explain it. So, so, the, so in short, the roots of today's crisis, such as it is, and it may may not be, uh, may not turn out to be all that huge a crisis in the end, uh, but then again it may. The roots of it are are what we need to study and what we need to attempt to understand, and, and nobody more so than than the people on the ground. So, it's something to watch very closely. This side, young gentleman. What was your, how was, like, how did your parents treat you when you were little? <laughs> I believe it was a, the traditional parental method of a little bit of carrot, a little bit of stick. Was it, so. was it mostly, you, yeah. and part of your childhood was mostly like you guys were typing? <laughs> Fingers still hurt. Um, <laughs> No, I wouldn't say that we typed for most of our childhood, although we probably typed a little bit most days of our childhood. How come? It, well, where did you get? Where did your dad dad get the idea of being a writer? Well, he got the idea from reading. To be a good writer, you have to be a good reader. First, I think that's probably number one, and and he read books. I mentioned before when he was very young. How old are you now? So he was even younger, a little bit younger than he was nine or ten. And he read some books that made such a deep impression on him that he knew he, that he, he wanted to and he would be a writer. Of course, that's, a, that's another conversation. I'm sure a lot of 
us feel at a young age that we know we're going to be something and then we don't, we don't do it. So, but I guess the point is he was one of the few, or probably relatively few, who did, who, so. And, and back to your other, other question, the reason I, I focused on that was not to uh, suggest that it was all work and no play, but because the context, you know, what the, my talk tonight is about, is about the creation of that work, is about the creation of that book, how it came to be, and basically that in our, in our own little way we were able to chip in a little bit and help what was really a daunting task, even for a very great man. Uh, make it a little bit more manageable. So, but we had a lot of fun, even even with the typing. Uh, this side. Are your, pardon me. Thank you. Are your father's works widely available in Russia now? Uh, where is the, right here. Yeah, oh yes. And I, mm -hmm. if so, what is his reputation in Russia? They are more widely available now than than ever before by a long shot. First, they were banned, of course, for all those years, completely unavailable. Um, then, when they became, well, became available, when, when Gorbachev, in the end, relented, and it was one of the last steps in his retreat from communism, was to allow the Gulag Archipelago to be published in the Soviet Union. And that was, of course, by definition, by allowing it to be published, he basically was putting himself out of business, which is why he, he waited that long. So when finally that happened, there were all kinds of crises that were shaking, obviously, that were shaking the world, that were shaking the country, uh, the whole crumbling of the Soviet Union, and then the, the, the economic implosion that occurred immediately at the same time. So people had not the time had not the inclination, uh, had not the paper on which to print books and so forth. So the whole book publishing industry cratered in a way that you know, they talk about in, in this, in, you know, because of Kindles and because of the internet, is nothing, you know, much, much, much worse than this. So people are reading in a Kindle, what's the difference? In the end, they're still reading. What matters is the process and not really what, what the physical, technological aspect of it is. So really people weren't reading anything. For Russia, at least, Russia is a country where reading is hobby number one, religion number one, religion number two. Uh, you know, but this is the, the extremely important. And now, during the relatively benign, um, relatively uh, uh, well well off the past decade, where Russian economy the last couple of years has not been very good, but broadly speaking, is going up income levels are going up, there's a rising middle class, so economically things are much better, and including in, the, in, in, in book reading in general, and the social needs in particular. I mean, there are so many, everything's of course is in print many times over, there are multiple editions of uh, many of the books, which you don't really see in this country. In this country you see, you, you really only see that with, with uh, classic authors who are in the public domain. You see Dickens. You'll see, you can go into the bookstore and you can see one edition of Oliver Twist and another edition of Oliver Twist and a hardback and a leather and then another competing paperback. But even then, maybe two or three or four and then only an Oliver Twist but not the old Curiosity Shop or Dombey and Son. So, and there you see First Circle or the Gulag or indeed the Red Wheel up here in multiple editions in large formats, small formats, everything everything you would like, and, and, and so that's, that's extremely encouraging. And not just Solzhenitsyn, but Dostoevsky and Chekhov and Tolstoy, and indeed many other authors who are working and writing today who, who have a lot to say and who, who I'm glad are being read. So basically that's an encouraging area. Yes, ma'am. In the original setup of, is this one? Um, you had 20, your father had 20 no notes that he was following. I'm wondering um, how far did he get into researching those remaining 16 that never got written? Where's that research now? Is the family going to ever make it available to another historian that would um, possibly do justice to his original founding? And a second question is, did you and your brothers decide not to return to Russia with your mother? Or you, you reside in the US? And if so, why did you choose not to go back? <coughs> Uh, both my brothers live 
in Moscow full time. I go to Moscow a great deal and spend a lot of a lot of time there, of course, professionally and 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 personally. Uh, in my in my field, in the profession of, of musician and a, a touring artist, the question of home is a little bit less clear in the first place. Home is, in some ways, home is the concert hall. Home is the audience. And maybe, to put it somewhat grandly, the, the music itself. And that's, that's what's always with, with me, and, you know, wherever I am. So that's the second part of your question. The first part of your question, about the, about the rest of the, the missing nodes, the other 16 nodes, Yes, the research is copious and quite fascinating and will be made available beyond any doubt to, uh, will be made, you know, to, to, to one way or another to, for, for anyone who wants to take it further or just to study it and see what it, but there is also a, 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 an interesting side note to this that I, I think you'll appreciate. He was a, even while being completely convinced that Four was enough, and that there was no need. Not only did he not have the wherewithal to continue in one lifetime, to, but as I explained, there was, it was already clear. You read those, everything's clear. But of course he, on some level, regretted. On some level, regretted, oh, I wish I could finish it, or I wish I could have. And what he did, to put a little bow on it, what do they call it today, closure, <laughs> is to write, to publish in... If you remember, Node 4 is April 1917. At the end of April, and when it comes out in English, you will see this exactly the same way we produced in the English edition, or you can see it now in the French uh, 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 translation, for example. The outlines of those nodes are at the end of the book, at the end of April, in, in a completely, un, utterly unpretentious form. And not, they're, they're, just an out, they're just outlines. But they are intense reading, and that's really fast-forwarding through those, those key moments. And again, he's, the idea of nodes, he describes this, and then he jumps to here, and he jumps to here. And so nothing is described in between. But even at that fast-forward warp speed uh, of these outlines, you almost get a sense of, really, of, of history proverbially jumping off the page. So quickly do these catastrophic events unfold. So, yes, those are... It's a great reward, I think, at the end of the red wheel to, to have that as a as a as a parting gift. This side, I promise to try to be fair. So, uh, this gentleman here, or oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. Is it, is it on? Yes. Okay. I've just been watching the Sakura conversations, mm. and um, he see. In, the, in these conversations, oh, these are available to us through Netflix, by the way. Um, he speaks a little about... We're talking about a documentary film made by one of the great filmmakers of Russia or any country, Sakurov, all the awards and golden palms and con and, and maybe Oscars as well. Anyway, Alexander Sakura, very important filmmaker. And he made a, a documentary film, which is really just conversations between him and my father. Uh, it's a, it's, it's, it's very slow and utterly, I don't know what there is in it of great filmmaking. Well, but it's, it's absolutely riveting uh, for maybe for its absolute lack of, of artfulness. It's something that many people have, I'm amazed how many people have brought it up as you are. So please to continue with your question. Okay. So the dialogues with social needs of Alexander Sakura. Well, he speaks surprisingly little about his, his time in Vermont, except to comment on how the birds are not, don't sing, and the differences mm -hmm. in the trees and things like that. Um, but one of the things that really intrigued me was that he talks a lot about his influences, particularly Karamzin and Platonov. And I'm wondering if, if you're aware of any other literary influences that impacted the Red Wheel in his writing? Sure. He, sp he spoke, he wrote about that, I don't have to guess. Uh, he spoke about it at, at, at different times and wrote about it. 
there are influences in, in spirit, in worldview. That would certainly be Dostoevsky. There are influences in st stylistic approach, where, again, having read War and Peace at nine years old, he was, I think, remained in love with Tolstoy's <coughs> style, I think, for the rest of his life, even though they often differed very severely on philosophical <coughs> issues. There was an author, I mentioned Dos Passos, not so much philosophically as in terms of certain innovations and, 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 and I mentioned a screenplay that I think Solzhenitsyn took a step further, if you will, as, as naturally one does when one borrows from, from, from someone and then builds on that. There was an author he called, considered his older brother, Mikhail Bulgakov who, of course, one of the great names in, in 20th century literature. I was just speaking uh, to some people about The White Guard, a book that is one of the great novels of the 20th century. And if you seek to understand events in the Ukraine, uh, no better primer than to read The White Guard, which is Kiev, 1918, when Ukraine is first gaining its, its, its independence. And uh, already the gruesome things that were happening at the time, beautiful, at the same time, beautiful, brief, relatively short, striking novel, Bogakov, uh, even more famous probably for Master and Margarita, uh, just one of the great names. And so Bogakov was someone he felt very close to. There are others, but those are some names. He, I think, was always delighted to acknowledge any debt that he owed to those who came before, or, or indeed were writing at, this, at the, his contemporaries, Ahmadova. Um, Shalamov, who wrote, of course, sort of the original Kalabate, the original tales about the Soviet gulag, about the concentration uh, labor camps. So he, he always, uh, I think, was, was glad to, to say, yes, I'm I'm standing on someone else's shoulders to, to be here. Someone from this side. What about this, coming back to this gentleman who didn't have a chance yet? All right, then we'll have two from the right side. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, when he writes about Lenin, your father writes about Lenin, you get this portrait of a man who's um, utterly, utterly exhausted. Uh, again, I'm only speaking reading uh, up to November. Um, a man utterly exhausted and almost obsessed with schism. Um, hmm. Well put. And can you perhaps uh, elaborate a bit uh, in your understanding uh, of your father's understanding of that? The, 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 those, I, those notions, of, those themes of schism and um, exhaustion in the person of, of, of Lenin and also your father's um, did, did he admire and re Lenin, and, and in what capacity? Great question. I, I, I appreciate that. I'll try to answer as well as I can. Did he admire Lenin? That's, that's difficult. You know, I suppose... I'll try to answer it like this. When I... And I'm sure I'm, I'm not alone in this. If, when I read Richard III, or see Richard III, I root for Richard, somehow, even though I, I know I shouldn't. And, and I know he's despicable. But there's something about that character that is, that it's impossible not to admire at a certain level. I hope that's okay to say. But I've, I've felt that since, since I first read Richard III, and I saw it on stage a couple of weeks ago, and I've read it, you know, many times. And, and I've always felt badly about that, but I can't help myself. <laughs> I, I think, so I think it's something along those lines, I'm speculating now, I'm not, not quoting my father or, or really suggesting this is, this is accurate, but 
he had Lenin's portrait in front of him on his desk for several years. He spent more time with Lenin than he did with, with, with his own family for a, for a certain amount of years because he would spend eight or ten hours a day at times, and he had plenty of other characters and uh, historical personages he was researching, but Lenin, of course, was, was huge. And he, came, as I said earlier, he came to despise him ever more. But I, clearly, on a certain level, he admired not anything that Lenin represented, but uh, maybe, I would say cautiously, admired certain qualities in Lenin. His perseverance, his that dogged kind of tunnel vision, which, of course, alienated everyone around him, his own, as you say, his own party comrades, but enabled him to achieve those, that vast, to perpetrate that vast evil that he, that his life, life's mission was to, was to do. So in, in, in those sense, in that sense, I suppose one could say he, he th that's what comes through, I would say, in, his, in, in, these, in these chapters, this in incredible energy, this demonic single-mindedness. And then the issue of schism, yeah, that's a hallmark of fanaticism, isn't it, is that purity, utter purity, that he starts off as part of the big, workers movement, the Socialist International, or whatever, right, whatever was originally called, going back to really to, to Engels. And then all the time he's shedding everyone who is heterodox. A little bit to the right, a little bit to the left, and of course it's always to the right. Nobody's to the left of Lenin. So it's always, so shedding, 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 not revolutionary enough, not fanatical enough, not pure enough. Not, and, and, that, and so he distilled his band of, of, of monsters uh, to, to a tiny group. But there was that logic behind the method to his madness was that group was able to take over and, and, uh, and bathe Russia in blood. So uh, Lenin, uh, a fri frightful Example of what our species is capable of. Two on this side, I promised. Yes. A much lighter question. I think we need that. Personal and musical. Was there a classic piece that really resonated with your dad? And B, have you ever been able to conduct it? <laughs> no, I think people heard the question is about is about music, and yeah, if there was a specific. Really yeah. I could I couldn't name I couldn't name a piece not because I I don't want to but because I can't. He I can name some composers. Yeah. Beethoven. Schubert. Uh, Tchaikovsky. Bach. So they're not uh, dark horse names, <laughs> um, <laughs> but they, they are some of the composers that he drew strength from that he liked to listen to. There were, and there were some other unexpected names, perhaps less expected names, for example, Sibelius. Sibelius is not in everybody's list. It's not so much on my list of, of composers I feel very close to, but he, he was very fond of Sibelius. And the, the other part of the question, yes, did I conduct works that he, that he particularly loved? Yes, absolutely. I mean, again, I can't say that, but for example, Beethoven symphonies. Uh, and so, and, and he was present at several occasions when I conducted the third and the fourth and the eighth and um, second. And, and I think he loved them as, 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 as any, I think, sane person does love, loves all the major <laughs> symphonies. And, and he was no exception. Another question on this side. Yes. Yeah, you spoke so eloquently about how he was able to do this important work in Vermont. Cavendish, from your perspective, what was his attitude, and I know it was complex, towards the West in general and the United States in particular, given 
the horrendous experiences he had had in the former Soviet Union and then his experience here in his own worldview, his own vision of what life should be. So the, if I may paraphrase your question, because the microphone didn't make it its way up, it's my fault. My father's attitude, broadly speaking, attitude to the West, as I understand your question. And the United States. In particular. And the United States in particular. Well, I, it's, a, it's a great question, and again, it's, uh, it's, 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 I'll try to limit, limit my answer just because we're already, I'm sure, past time, and, and, and it's, a, it's a big topic. Um, first of all, America came as a great positive surprise in his life. I say that because in 1974, 1975, in those years that we were living in Switzerland, no different from 2014, America was looked down upon by European elites. As far as I can see, nothing's changed. <laughs> so there was that sense that everybody, that he imbibed in a way with, with just with the air in Europe. Not so much in Russia, which of course Soviet was a different situation, but in, in, in Switzerland and France and in Italy, and, right, that, that America's all the stereotypes that, that all of you gather here know to be untrue. Uh, <laughs> that America's uncultured, that America doesn't read, that America doesn't care, that America doesn't know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, he didn't really have, he didn't know otherwise. I don't think he held that opinion strongly, he just, but that his default position was probably in that, more or less in that vein. What all the bien pensant had, had suggested must be true. Now, I mentioned this idea of have to get away from Switzerland, have to get away from Europe, just go somewhere where I can write, etc. I'm not going to recap all that. Canada seemed like a good choice because Canada, as we all know, is civilized <laughs> and, and much friendlier and so forth. And so that Canada would be nice. And so he flew to Canada. Flew, I think he landed in Montreal, obviously Toronto, I think he landed in Montreal, had speeches and, and it was a very public visit at the time, spring of 75, I guess. And then traveled the whole way west by train. You can still do that today, right? The Canadian Pacific, right? whatever that is. And he was disappointed. I, I'm sorry for any Canadians here on some, <laughs> But he was disappointed in the sense, this is of course a, a generalization, he was disappointed in the, what he perceived as lack of dynamism in, in Canada. This is of course a visitor's impression. He might have been completely wrong, but he felt that it was sleepy. He felt that it wasn't up to the, the speed and the, of the times and the, and the intensity of the questions. <laughs> Remember what's happening in the world in terms of the communist expansion that is in full throttle in the mid-70s and, the, and, the, and Vietnam and et cetera, et cetera. So, so he wasn't too impressed with, again, just broadly speaking. Now, then he came to Hoover and he came, his first I think it was when he first came to America was through California. Uh, I, I don't have that sequence exactly correct, but in any case, he saw New York, he saw Washington, he gave speeches, he had meetings, he saw it, he was looking already looking for a home. And so what emerged was that America was far more, not only far more impressive than Canada to him, but um, be, because of all the, essentially the opposite, because it was dynamic, because it was varied, because it was uh, engaged, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but also really was unlike all the, the things that he had heard uh, from, from fellow Europeans. So, so that's one aspect of it, is that, it is, is that he wasn't planning to move to America, but he did, and he was so happy, I think, that he made that, he made that choice. With respect to American, two more things I'll mention. Again, it's an inexhaustible topic, potentially, but American policy and American society, American culture. With respect to policy, he was profoundly concerned that 
the West, and by definition America at its helm, the free peoples of the world, the free countries of the world. If you look at those maps, if you look at the freedom map, there's the economic freedom, political freedom, freedom house, the outfit in New York put, puts that out every year. If you look at those maps over the years, you'll see how small the free world had become by 1975. How many countries had fallen under, under various totalitarian yokes or at least dictatorship. And so he was uh, so many, as everybody behind the Iron Curtain was worried, is America going to, is the West going to have enough gumption to stand up and to fight for what they don't know what they have? They seem to not value it. They're going to lose it like this. This led him to uh, perhaps, as he later admitted, to overplay his hand a bit. In other words, he was so concerned that the West would be too weak that he may have exaggerated, I would say subconsciously, it wasn't some kind of a Machiavellian tactic in his part, but, but, but he was so afraid of this that he exaggerated the imminence of peril or the likelihood that the West would indeed sink in, 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 in a morass of weakness. And of course, very soon after uh, he came to this country, John Paul II was elected pope, the first pope from behind the Iron Curtain, the first, not, you all know this, non-Italian pope in 400 and some years, a, an incredible event, not just for Catholics, for, for, for any uh, freedom-loving people, I think, in, in the world. And then the election of Reagan, and bef uh, the pope, and then Margaret Thatcher, in 1979, and Ronald Reagan in 1980. And these three figures uh, clearly changed, changed the course of events, clearly changed the balance, uh, the balance of the percentages of, of, uh, of who would win and, what would, and which way the Cold War would end, would end up. And so, so even as he was issuing his warnings, things were already afoot, changes were afoot, and, and voters in the case of Reagan and Thatcher, and divine intervention in the case of John Paul II or the college of, was, was, was changing the landscape. And the last thing, I guess, society, culture, I'm not really up, up, up to this topic, but I, I think I, I would just say that he saw trends in American society that worried him. I think they can be summed up as the decadence that comes with that comes with a, a surfeit of freedom. Now, there is no such thing as a surfeit of freedom. You can't have too, you can never be too rich or too thin. They say surely you you can't be too free, but you can in this sense that you start to take it for granted. And this is, I think that any person probably in this room must be aware on some level of that, the possibility, the, the danger, whether you felt it in your own life, whether you've seen it amongst your fellow citizens, uh, that, that's, that's, that's a danger that, that he felt was very clearly present. And so, and then everything that stems from that, if there is, there is no, if, 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 if the benefits and, and the good graces of providence are, are ours to keep forevermore with no price, then, then everything is allowed. Then everything should be focused on pleasure, on the fulfillment of, of what I want. And, and uh, freedom is not about respecting your neighbor, but it's about fulfilling your own wishes, et cetera, et cetera. These are obviously uh, big, big questions, but those were the, those were the, I would say those were the questions that concern him, uh, the, the, the excessive, I suppose that's a point of view as well, litigiousness uh, that was already in the 1970s evident in, in America, probably more so now than, than ever before. Questions like that, would, are these healthy trends in a society? Well, I think he would be the first to admit that Western society, American society in particular, proved to be more adaptable and more resilient than he had feared. And by the way, uh, my personal two cents on this, 
as we study democracy, and in particular as we study capitalism, what's striking for all its faults and, 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 sh and shortcomings, what's striking over these, how long has capitalism been around, more or less in the current form, 500, 600 years? And we see the adaptation and how quickly uh, a capitalist, still sounds like a pejorative word, but right, a free, a free market, how quickly those societies, such societies, like America certainly, broadly speaking, can adapt and fix the problems that the excesses or the imbalances and so on and so forth. Far from perfect, but that's the biggest difference between um, a free, basically a free society and a basically unfree society where uh, inequality and, 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 and injustices set in stone forever. Oof. <laughs> Political theorist, but I say one on TV. Yes. There's maybe one more question. One more question. Okay. Ignat. Uh, over here, please, Mr. Ovard. Uh, what I wanted to know is, I know prior to your father's death, he had a meeting with Vladimir Putin. There's that famous. I know prior to your father's passing, he met with Vladimir Putin in Moscow. There's that famous picture of them meeting together in the New York Times, and what I wanted to know is, what did they say to one another, and what was that conversation <laughs> like? Well, didn't the New York Times publish a transcript of the conversation? Um, I w first of all, I wasn't there. Uh, I think one of, or both of my brothers were, were, were either at the meeting, well, or were part of the meeting. I wasn't in town, as they say. Uh, so, so I don't know really what was said. Of course, I talked about it with my father and my mother, and I would say that my father did not hold back, as was never his, uh, his habit to hold back, and so he did not hold back in letting Putin know probably all, I don't know if he fit it all in, but all the ways... <laughs> Uh, in which he felt um, Russian society could continue to improve. <laughs> also, and, and I do think he found Putin to be a very keen and engaged listener. I think my father spoke much more than Putin spoke. <laughs> I think that's accurate to say. And that's really about all I can say. I'm not, I, I, I'm not going to suggest that I'm holding, holding back some kind of a bombshell that's going to be revealed in, you know, when the freedom of information comes. <laughs> it's, there, but the, for, for a discussion like that to be frank and, and one hopes useful for, for and it, frankly, it can only be useful for Putin. I mean, I, I don't think it was terribly useful for my father. And it's a, it, 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 it had to be, it had to be, of course, confidential. And it had to be for, for it to be, it had to be frank, and, and it had to be private, so that one would like to think Putin was able to take that what he that what he might agree with, or things that he that would make him think or reevaluate certain things. Um, to what extent that's happened? course is, is very much open to question. I, in, fairness, in fairness to Putin, I would just say that he has, really from the get-go, when he was thrust into power in 1999, he, he's had a difficult hand, there's no question, in terms of, uh, in terms of the, the basic number one responsibility of, of a head of state, which is to, which is to which is to provide for this, what does Mr. Obama say, safety and security, or my job is to protect American citizens, right? That's the first job of, of, a, of a, so the basic, but even more basic than to protect citizens is to protect a country for them to live in, you might say. So in other words, just the very notion that there is a Russia, uh, it may seem, in 2014, it may already seem quaint 
or, or, or outdated, but uh, in, in the early aughts, uh, there was a lot of question whether Russia would su survive as a, as, a, as a political entity, as, an, as, a, as a nation, as a country, not, not splintered into a million pieces and, and so on and so forth. So, so he's had, I wouldn't trade places with him. He's had a difficult job and, and he's clearly made, made uh, mistakes as well as I, I think some decisions that have been, have looked better with time. And of course the jury is still out because as we know, he's going to be with us for a while. Uh, so, so, <laughs> so, so we'll see when it's all over in whatever year that may, that may be, we'll see what the, what the final jury is. But I think my father has always been open to, as they say, open to dialogue and open to persuading from that famous letter to the Soviet leaders, who he knew could never be persuaded, who were at the very opposite end of the spectrum. From, but he wrote them that letter not because he really felt they were going to act upon his recommendations, but because he thought, well, because, because he was, I, 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 on some level, because he did have hope. And he thought, maybe there's, maybe there's one of them in that Politburo who, who has a conscience. Maybe there's one of them who will at least secretly think, maybe, maybe we should be thinking about the future, we should. <coughs> so uh, he met with Yeltsin. Uh, he would have met certainly with Gorbachev had he, had he asked or wanted to, which he didn't. Uh, so uh, I think he was always open to trying to influence for good and, and what, whether he did have any effect is, uh, he, I think he would have, he would have said very little in, in the direct political sense. I think, Mr. Solzhenitsyn, it remains for us to heartily thank you for a very interesting, indeed fascinating, presentation on your dad. You have obviously taken over the historian's role in addition to your musical oh. career. <laughs> I wish that you would continue, and I thank you very heartily. Thank you very much. Well. Thank you all for being so engaged and coming tonight, and uh, appreciate it.